All right, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about, well, reducible topological recursion. That's, I mean, strictly speaking, it should be something like multi branch topological recursion, but we won't care about that. Um, so, this is going to be the basic outline of my talks, and we'll hope to actually make it all the way to the bottom. Um, if, um, if you like, I could put them in the exercises. Uh, but probably not. I may draw some squiggles here and there, anyways, for your entertainment. But that's not the main point of the talk, of course. Um, yeah, so as I said, uh, I hope to get to the bottom, but. Uh, mm -hmm. I will not rush anything, uh, and of course you can always ask questions about applications if you want to anyways. And of course applications is also part of the motivation, so you'll get some idea of it. Um, also, just as a general reminder, please do ask questions, because I'm here for you, you're not here for me. And then let me just start at part zero. So, reducible TR sounds a bit vague, maybe. The main motivation of this talk is to generalize the formula for topological recursion that we've seen in part one to deal with more complicated spectral curves. So reducible TR should more properly be called TR on reducible spectral curves. And well, why would we want to do that? Uh, you could say, well, this is just fun because it's a theoretical possibility, so we should explore it. And that's honestly one motivation. Another one is that um, this could lead to another couple of problems that can be solved by TR, and this is also part of the motivation, and hopefully I'll give an application like that. Um, and a third one, which I quite like, is that, well, topological recursion, you can do it on a spectral curve, and that's all nice and dandy, but if you want to prove something, you may want to not look at one spectral curve, but look at a family of spectral curves. And if you want to prove something about a particular spectral curve, you may want to approach that in a certain way from another one. But then, of course, you need to think about how that behaves. And specifically, um, if you want to look at higher ramification, which is what I'll start with in a bit, it turns out that you may want to take certain limits of spectral curves, but these spectral curves themselves may already be complicated. And this is another thing that could be um, at least, well, approached in this way. And for that, I would also like to say that reducible spectral curve is, again, a bit of a misnomer, because what we're rather thinking about is somehow a global version of topological recursion in a vertical sense which may not make sense to you right now, and I'll try to explain that a bit as well. But think about limits and deformations as a possible application. But let's just start with actual mathematics in section 1.1. So higher ramifications, um, I will not assume that you've all seen higher ramifications of topological recursion before, because it wasn't covered in part one. So let's just recall the, form, the actual formula for TR. And I'm not going to write the entire thing because it's a mess. But the main, there are several main points. We have some kind of sum over points in a ramification locus, which I'll call R for ramification locus. Then we take some residues at this ramification locus. We have some function, which is the integral of something we call B, with some arguments. We divide by something. And then we have some kind of second Factor, which is why the actual recursion takes place. Some g, uh, sorry, g minus one, n plus one, where we have z prime and sigma of z prime with something else, 
and something I'm going to write even more vaguely as a product of two things. You've all seen this formula in more details before, I hope, so no need to recopy this. But the main feature of this formula, for this talk at least, well, there are two. First of all, there is some kind of essential thing going on with this sigma. Sigma is a local involution. And a local involution exists because we have something, we have some function x which locally goes as x of a certain point, which is the ramification point. Recording in progress. Plus a square. And of course, you know that if you take this, we can go from one branch of the square root, basically, to another. Now, section 1.1 here is called higher ramification. So maybe this is going to be problematic. And in fact, it will be. So higher ramification will gen just be replacing this factor 2, or this power 2, with something higher. And one of the first issues would be that we don't have a sigma anymore. Another issue would be this part, where, well, you may have seen the, the graphical thing, where we take something of genus G, which I guess I can draw a bit, with one point on that side, and a couple points on the other side. And this sum here, well, there's some implicit sum here. This gives you a way of taking out a uh, pair of hands. So you could have something like this. Plus, well, disconnecting it. Maybe something like this. and other terms of, this, of the same kind. And there's also a reason that we have this trivalent thing, because we have these two points here. And again, this is related to the fact that we have an involution, so that we have simple ramification. So another thing that we would like to generalize for higher ramification is this trivalent vertex, and we want to make a larger, well, pair of pants with more legs or something. Um, and, well, this is not too new. This has been solved, actually, uh, nine years ago. So the question is, what, what do you want to do in a more general case? So suppose now we have some function, x, which goes as point plus, let's say that's who they are. Now, I'm just going to give you the formula, and it's a bit of a hassle to write down, but it's important, so I'll have to do it at some point. The main idea is still the same. So we will do a recursion in the first variable. Now I'm actually going to give a name to the rest, though. And I will mostly write down this formula to introduce notation, so I'll go through it in steps. The first notation here is that if I have a natural number and I enclose it in brackets, that means that this is a set from 1 up to that natural number. And if I use a set as a sub-index, that means that it's actually the set of variables indexed by them. So this is the set z1 up to zn. I'll use that a lot. Now, in general, we can have things like uh, this. So we can have ramification points at different places as before. So we will still have to do kind of some kind of sum. And we'll also still do some kind of residue. But now things get a bit more complicated. And in fact, so suppose we have something of order 3. So say r is 3 and not 2. Then from this story I've told you, you could imagine that, well, maybe we don't want this pair of pants with two legs, but one with three legs. And that's correct. 
except that we also want the one with two legs. I'm not going to motivate this. This is just true. Um, this is going to be just the first part of the, of the course, so I can't put too much time in this. But the issue is that we have to make quite a large sum over not just all local well involutions or, or transpositions or um, permutations, rather, but we have to actually take a sum over certain subsets. So we'll have another sum. And again, I'll use introduce some notation. So what I'm going to write here is something I'll call f prime f prime at a of z prime. So let me introduce this notation. We have this function x, right? So I'm going to draw some kind of spectral curve. Let's say r equals 3. We have three sheets coming together. We have a function x. So this is our spectral curve, which I will denote sigma. x is just a meromorphic function, so this is go to p1. And over a certain point here, well, this is going to be a. Uh, sorry, this is going to be a. And somewhere near, we will have a couple of inverse images, at least local. So these are the inverse images close to A. And if one of these is going to be Z prime, then I will call these other inverse images, so these elements in the same fiber that are close to A, those are these three, because we could also have some other sheet that's just irrelevant. I will call this set, maybe use a, let's use a different color for that actually. This set will be f a z prime. So these are some of the local conjugates of our point. In this story, we would just have z prime and sigma of z prime in this set. But now, if this is order r, we will have r elements in this set. And for convenience, I'll also add yet another symbol. If I add a prime, it means I don't take the original element. So it's the fiber minus the thing itself. This is what we're summing over. Rather, it's even worse, we're summing over subsets of this thing. But we're summing over non-empty subsets. Now, in the case that r equals 2, a non-empty subset of a one-element set, there aren't too many options. So this sum collapses completely. But for higher r, we will have to introduce it, sadly. Now, we still have this integral of b. Let me be a bit more explicit. And now we have these two places where this involution used to come in. We have this place, where I just realized I forgot the parenthesis. And we've got this place. And again, I'm just going to give you the formula here. So here, we will actually need to add several factors. So I'm going to get a product over all elements in this capital Z, so the subset of this fiber I took. Of factors that are similar to that. No, sorry, is, there, is it hard to distinguish between capital Z and small Z here? For context, no, but there should be. OK, in that case, I will not use a dash for yeah. capital Z anymore. But please keep reminding me of that. <laughs> How am I going to sum over twos? OK, wait, 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 I can do this. Is this OK? Oh. <laughs> Great, great, great.
Okay, this is one thing. And now, well, this part was already a pain to write down in the usual case, so it's going to be even worse. Sorry about that. I will just call it this. So that would be correct. Oh, sorry, fancy that. Of course, this doesn't tell you anything because I haven't defined this thing. But now I shoot. Fancy that again. Sorry, I'm going to make lots of mistakes writing this thing, so please keep reminding me. So what I just told you is we have this sum over subsets, and I also said that we want to generalize this picture. So what happens if we, say, have a four-valent vertex? I can draw that. I'm not going to draw the general case because that's impossible, but um, a four-valent vertex for the same kind of story. Well. It's going to look something like this. And note that here I took a genus 2 surface and we had genus 1 left over. But here it's going to be genus 0 because there are two holes coming. But we, of course we can also disconnect again. So we could have something which is totally disconnected. say something like this. And we can also have things in between. So you can see that the combinatorics of this story gets a bit complicated. Um, so we'll have to do quite some sums. First of all, uh, we need to, well, pick a partition of, say, these inputs. So we have these inputs are labeled by Z. So I'm going to partition them by, let's say, letter L. Partition means that um, this is a dis uh, disjoint, un well, sorry, these are subsets of this fancy Z whose disjoint union is equal to Z, all of the parts are non-empty, right? Then I also need to partition the outputs, or rather these numbers. But this is not quite a partition because, as I drew here, we could have empty things. So I'm just going to use a disjoint union labeled by the elements of L. And let's call these ML. Uh, a third thing we need to sum over are the genera of all of these components. Because, well, in this case I took 1, 1, 2, uh, 1, 1, 0, but of course I could have done that in a different way. So we want to sum over G1 up to, well, G size of L. And, of course, there's going to be some kind of condition on the sum of these. I would not. Okay, I will not. Well, I'm, okay, I will just not use red. Let's use green. So, is this better? Or is it worse? Is it similar? <laughs> No. Okay. G1 up to G. Uh, let me just going to say I'm gonna, we'll have G, L for L and L. Now, what is the summation condition? You see, um, this number. Uh, 
remaining genus here depends on both the number of connected components and on, well, what we started with and on the actual number of legs here. The actual condition is that the genus G here must be a sum over GL minus one. And I think there's, there's an I on one side, which I never know which one it is. Let me just check. plus i. And then, of course, well, what do we have left? We have to actually write down the correlators. So we have to take some kind of product. Um, oh, sorry. i is the size of z. Thanks. OK. I don't, I mean, honest answer, no, but I'm going to. <laughs> so, sum. We summed over a partition of, uh, sorry, of, of Z. Then we also had to partition this natural num, uh, this finite set here, but it's not quite a partition because it's just a, dis, a like, disjoint union of uh, sets which may be empty. And I think I called them ML just before. So this is a disjoint union of sets ML indexed by this partition of the sets from one to N. It's not all gonna be that tech this technical, but I just need to write down this formula. So sorry about that. And now we actually have the correlators. So by now we have all of these indices, so we should put them somewhere. First of all, the genus, as usual. Then, well, how many entries will we have? We will have uh, the size of L, because, well, L is an element of the partition, so that's a subset of Z. But also ML. And then here, I'm just going to write L because that is this subset of Z. But please think about these pictures. Don't think about, well, I mean, you should see the formula at least once. But think about the pictures. What you have to do is draw some kind of thing like this, then decide how many components you want, distribute both the inputs and the outputs, and distribute the genera such that the entire picture has the right genus. That is what this horrendous sum actually does. Okay, now I should say maybe what does this formula actually mean? I mean, I've written down something, and uh, that's nice and all, but it has to mean something. So first of all, I should say this is not my formula. This is uh, Bouchard in R. which I think has the best title of any TR paper I know at least. Uh, think globally, compute locally. So what is this formula actually saying? Um, well, it gives us a way of calculating topological recursion correlators for a spectral curve which may have higher order ramification. That is one way of seeing the formula. But what's so great about this title is that it gives you two ways of thinking about it, and this formula also has two ways of thinking about it. Because, well, I gave you this local picture, but actually, the same formula also holds if instead of this red line, I'm gonna use green now, sorry. Um, if we actually summed over this entire thing. You could do that, and the sum becomes very different because suddenly we have, well, four sheets instead of three. So this becomes way more complicated. I'm not gonna draw all of these pictures even because it's too much. But miraculously, the answer is the same. That is the point of, well, think globally and compute locally. Thinking globally is nice, but 
the computations become horrible because we have way too many pictures. But the main point of that paper was that, um, first of all, this formula makes sense. What it means to make, sen uh, to make sense is that these things are actually well-defined and symmetric, which um, you've probably heard from Bertrand. It's, it's far from obvious from these formulae that correlators are symmetric, but they are. And that holds in this larger generality. And second of all, you can either choose to calculate locally near a branch point, or you can do a sum over all of the sheets. And that'll give you the same answer. Now, that's pretty good. Um, and that is the answer to what higher ramification is. But of course, if that was the end of the story, I wouldn't be here today. Well, or at least I wouldn't be talking. So the question is, what more can we do? And this is where pictures become hard because everything's complex and not real, and I can't draw uh, plane curves in the complex sense. But what's actually nice is that we can generalize this in a, well, in several ways. First of all, uh, this is something I don't think you've all heard about yet, but we're still assuming here that this Y is fairly straightforward. So we still have assumptions. First of all, Y is regular. In the sense that it doesn't have a pole. And, well, you may want to lift this condition. Particularly, uh, there are examples of topological recursion where this does not hold that do in fact calculate interesting invariants. So we may want to get rid of this. One other thing, and yeah, so this is where pictures kind of break down, is that I usually want to think of this pair. So you could say that x, y give the spectral curve as a plane curve, but rather this pair gives our spectral curve as a curve in the tangent space of, or the cotangent space of P1. This is the way I want to think about it. And this is a usual condition, but actually um, what we could want is this not to be an injection, but maybe something slightly more general. So this is the condition here being that this is an injective map. But what if it's not injective? So think about maybe a curve of the shape x minus y to, y to the minus 2 times x minus y squared, something like this. This is a perfectly well-behaved curve, of course equals zero. And you may wonder if topological recursion does anything for this. Or even, nice example, I like this one. Just this. Again, this is reducible, uh, but it's perfectly well-defined as a curve. And it uh, turns out, this, well, conjecturally, at least, this calculates something interesting. But of course, that means that we need to make sense of what it means uh, or how to calculate with this. So this is still an assumption here. Another technical assumption, which is actually quite interesting, is that um, we can only have one ramification in each fiber. So for example, in this picture, supposing I were to uh, extend it and have a, something like this, where these are in the same fiber, 
I'm going to use red for this because you should not do this. This is not allowed according to Bouchard-Ena, or at least according to that paper. But the question, of course, is why not? Um, their answer was, well, technically we couldn't deal with that at the time or we didn't want to. But the question now becomes, is that an actual restriction or is that just a technical thing that they couldn't deal with? And, well, the answer is not necessarily clear yet, but we're working on it. But anyway, so the question is, how can we think about these assumptions and uh, maybe get rid of them? And still make sense of this formula because each of these formulae can be uh, sorry each of these assumptions can be lifted and the formula is still well posed a priori. So basically, this formula will be kind of universal, except that we don't know if it actually calculates anything. Because as I said before, this symmetry of correlators is an issue. This formula is very non-symmetric. And proving that correlators are symmetric is um, hard. And that's actually going to be the main part of this talk. So I will mostly try to rephrase this formula, rephrase topological recursion. And uh, one important tool for that is going to be airy structures. And airy structures, um, they're quite a different formulation. But the main advantage of them is that they give you a way to actually prove symmetry. And, well, then there is a lot of hassle translating between the two points, but I think it's important for you to see that, so I'll talk about that. That's actually going to be most of the talks. And then, well, there are going to be conditions. Because, uh, spoiler, it's not always possible to get symmetric correlators out of this. There are examples. So, counterexample. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't use green. Maybe let's use black. Suppose we say um, set x of z equal to set z to the 7, which is higher order, but that's perfectly fine by now. But we also allow y to have a pole of order 2. Now, um, of course, that doesn't satisfy this, so it's not covered by the paper. But you could still wonder, well, maybe we can still do this. Um, and the answer is no, we cannot. This does not give symmetric correlators. Oh, sorry, this is getting too small, I guess. And I do want to emphasize that this is more than a slight issue because, um, of course, you can start calculating and at some point you get something non-symmetric here. But at the next step in the recursion, it's not even clear what to do anymore. Because if these are not symmetric, then there are many different ways we can plug them in again. And that's not going to give you the same thing a priori. So this really breaks down everything. So symmetry is, is really implicitly essential for any TR formula. But it doesn't always hold in general. So the question is, what kind of conditions will we get? And, well, this will be wrong. But uh, on the other hand, if we take, say, z to the 7, uh, z to the seven and y equals, say, z to the minus 3, that does work. No, these look pretty similar, but they're not. So what's going on? And that's going to be um, quite a large part of the talk. So are there any questions at this point? Um, because if not, I'll continue. If there are, please go ahead. Yeah. One question. Um, you said we were thinking of assumption when you call this Like, it's, it's the 
uh, your country number was the uh, Asian national country. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's like just the more less shows to be less than and so it is like that's why it's important. Well, so I'm not quite sure what your question is. So, so you, do you want to as a, add assumptions? Mm -hmm. Unramified. I mean, if it's completely unramified, this formula should give zero. There's no ramification whatsoever because it's an empty sum. So it's not much to be said there. Although uh, I think there are formulas for unramified TR, which Norm has something to say. Really um, but yeah, at least this formula will give you zero. So that's kind of a boring answer. Thanks. Norm. Um, I don't know this one exactly, but I'll give you an, one in the exercises where omega zero three is non-symmetric, and you can calculate it. So quite often it, it breaks down early, and yeah, Nitin should know the answer, I think. So it, it can it it often. I mean, quite often you can somehow find a general bounds given the initial data where it should start to break down. So for this one, I wouldn't know it from the top of my head, but often it's pretty early. And also because, um, so what we did in our main paper, which I should probably mention at some point, uh, we, we gave a partial classification and we also looked at when it doesn't work. And that was mostly just calculating omega zero threes and omega one half twos. Um, I'm going to add one half at some point. And um, because uh, for general spectral curves, it's hard to calculate harder things, but already in genus zero, many things break down. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Um, right, so I just mentioned uh, genus one half. That's just technically, there is no reason we should not allow for half integer genus. And, well, actually that's not quite true. If you have anything of this kind of shape, uh, half integer genus does not make sense, but I'll add it later on, so I'll tell you about it at that point. Okay. So this is the usual TR formula we won't need anymore. So, okay, we're going to analyze this formula a bit. And I want to stress that there are several parts to it, which are kind of of independent interest. So we have this one. We have this one. Um, and this one is also quite important, rather maybe like this. So um, from general theory of Riemann surfaces, we know that a uh, differential form is determined by, well, by its poles or its, its principal parts and finite extra datum which is given by uh, integrals along certain cycles, periods. What this tells us, actually, is that the omega gn are, so these are, of course, differential forms in each of their arguments. And in, if this, in this kind of decomposition, like looking at poles and periods, they only have poles at the ramification points, and they're given in this way. And the technical formula is called, this is called the projection formula. So this just follows from general um, Riemann surface theory plus this formula itself.
is that this thing is equal to this sum over, residue of, over ramification points of these residues. Again, this integral over b, which I'm not going to write explicitly, of the thing itself, but now with the argument z prime. So this is not a deep result. It just follows from the way we construct these things. But it does help us to um, change this formula a bit because, well, our goal is basically proving symmetry whenever we can. And, well, if we want to prove symmetry, it's nice if we actually have a symmetric formula. So that's what I want to go for first. And this helps us because we can plug that in on this side. And then we've got this, well, this black box on both sides, and we can just put it on the same side. That's also nice because here we have a sum over non-empty subsets. So what, the question may be, what does the empty subset correspond to? And the empty, empty subset is actually exactly the left-hand side of this formula. So using this, what we rather get is something which looks a bit more symmetric, just a sum of residues. Again, this integral over B. And, um, well, again, we've got some 1 over y factor, which is just this kind of thing. Oh, of course, we have a sum over all z's now, fancy z's. And we've got these kind of things. This is all very sketchy, I know. But I would like to emphasize just that the difference here is that this may now be empty. That's really the only difference. And of course, for that to hold, I need to tell you that, um, ah, wait, there's a mistake here. We need to also have Z itself, Z prime itself in there. Sorry. Um, so if you take this fancy Z to be empty, then what you get here is this W G one N argument Z, Z ends. And actually maybe small exercise, you can show that in that case, this entire formula just collapses to the one correlator we have on this side. So that tells us that bringing that one correlator on the left-hand side to the right-hand side does actually give us a nice formula, which is of this shape with lots of sums and indices that I'm not going to write a second time. And the main advantage of this, of course, is that we are getting something slightly more symmetric. And that's something we want to use. Now, this y, I just had it here. I should probably give a formula for that. And actually, no, actually I'm going to write it in a slightly different way. I'm going to take out y. And then I'll multiply by the remainder. So what I want to do is we divide here by all of the elements that are in Z. But what I want to do is actually divide by all of the elements, period. So this is going to be a product over the entire fiber. Of course, still excluding the element itself because if we take this difference, that would be zero, so it would be kind of boring. In this shape, I could take it out, but then of course I need to compensate by adding something here. Okay. 
And in this case, the product will be about everything that's not yet in this edge. So these are the Z primes that are not in, uh, sorry, they're in the fiber, but not in fancy Z. Now, this just may look like some meaningless rewriting, and fair enough. It's not quite the case, though, because what this helps us with is analyzing pole structures. Because what, well, what are we looking at? We want to see that some residues vanish. And for residues to vanish, well, the easiest way of getting that to work is just for the argument to be holomorphic, right? Um, of course, there are many other functions that have no residues, but this is the easiest way of doing it. And if we just write it in this shape, well, we have this y, which will definitely give us some kind of pole. And the easiest way to make the entire thing holomorphic is just having a condition on this that it has the right vanishing order. And this is actually, I mean, it, it may look a bit out of the blue, but this is actually what we're going to do. We're going to see how we can impose the right vanishing order of this thing. If we get that, then this will be zero. That's equivalent to TR. But the nice thing about this is that this is a slightly more symmetric object. And there's going to be an exercise on the exercise sheet that will actually analyze this thing here. Because it turns out that if you look at this in the right way, um, there's some kind of combinatorial trick to play with them to make this into a slightly nicer behaved thing. That's what we will call the abstract loop equations. And I'll not say anything about that right now, um, except for, well, the section being called loop equations. But this is basically a teaser because we want to derive loop equations from a completely different direction. And this is what section two will all be about. We're going to take a very different point of view. And our goal in the end will be to get something like this, which is going to be, well, vanishing of the right order. So this is basically the geometric part of the story for now, the motivation for the next section. And the next section will really start from a quite a different direction, from a very algebraic one. But I wanted to show you this first because otherwise it seems like it's completely random what I'm doing. So the goal of the story is to find vanishing of certain things that I'll be more explicit about in a bit and simultaneously to get some kind of symmetry out of that because otherwise we can get these weird counterexamples that do not give symmetry, uh, symmetric correlators. Right, okay, so let's leave section one at that for now. Um, so this formula, I hope you've all written it down, but if not, um, I'm not going to rewrite it. You just need to know the kind of shape. It's also all over the literature, so it shouldn't be hard to find. So maybe uh, a comment for people who are more algebra geometrically minded. Topological recursion uh, in this formulation is basically local. So even though we do everything or we write everything in terms of geometry, of course it's just algebra because everything can be made up fine. So this is the reason we're going to do algebra from now. Okay, so section two. Airy structures. Right. Oh, please don't look at the colors. They don't mean anything, I think. I haven't figured out what they mean anyways. So airy structures are an algebraic reformulation or maybe <coughs> generalization, depending on your point of view, of a topological recursion. And it's really quite a different point of view. 
So at first it may look a bit strange. Um, but I'll, like, uh, one important part of this talk will be to give you the connection and to see what we can actually get from this. So I guess I should just start with some definitions. Um, I should also say this is all on Savage Schleubelmann. Right, so this is just going to be algebra. And we start with some kind of vector space. I'm not going to be too technical here, but if it's infinite dimensional, we want this to be filtered with an exhaustive increasing filtration whose finite parts are finite dimensional. But if you don't care about that, I won't either. Um, with a basis. Indexed by some index set. And a dual basis. Right. Um, okay, so first what I want to talk about is the completed while algebra. So here we're starting to introduce some H bar. And this is going to be, well, it's basically the algebra of differential operators on these things. So this is just an algebra. So this is generated. By elements, well, you want to take the coordinate functions, which is just a dual basis. We want to be able to derive with respect to these things. So we call them this, and we're adding h bars here. We also want to just have h bar itself. But just to be clear, uh, del a is not an element of this thing. And then, of course, um, h bar is central. Actually, sorry, I want to have h bar to the power 100. And as you can probably imagine, I want this commutator to be h bar. That's about it. Now, it's not quite just this. We want to allow for certain infinite sums and not all. And again, I'm not going to worry you with the details, but you can find them in several papers. And right, one other thing, I want to grade this thing by saying that the degree of all generators is equal to 1. Now we can introduce an area structure. And I may just call this AS in the future. And I'll start with an area structure in normal form. Well, what would this be? This is a collection of operators in this completed while algebra. So We're going to call them H. Um, 
And first of all, note that these are indexed by the exact same index set I've used before. That's not a coincidence. Because that's essential for the first of two conditions. The first being that uh, these have some certain leading order behavior. Namely, uh, they don't have a constant term. And they're degree one term. So constant being constant for this degree. Um, their linear term is h bar dA. And then they may have higher order terms. Generally, they will. Secondly, there's something, some kind of subalgebra, some or ideal or whatever condition, which is not quite either. Suppose we have two of these. We can take the commutator. And, well, this will again be in the ideal generated by these things. So that just means that we can write it like this. But it's slightly more general. This sum may be infinite. And in case of infinities, uh, there's again some kind of filtered condition that I won't make explicit. And there's some other thing here is that there should be a prefactor h bar. So it's not just some kind of ideal, but it's actually something slightly stronger. Now, the claim is uh, that this is basically equivalent to topological recursion, even though you may not see it right now. Of course, it's not exactly the case, but what we will do is we will construct area structures and then translate them all the way back to this formula that I gave just a moment ago. But of course, uh, first of all, maybe we should think a bit about what this actually does because, well, this is just some definition and why do we care? Well, first of all, it's related to TR. But second of all, there is a very important theorem and this theorem tells us something about symmetry. And remember, that's what we're looking for. I would actually like to give you an idea of this proof of symmetry. So the main theorem here, main theorem on area structures, this is again Kosevich Schlegelmann, um, is that, well, these are differential operators because they lie in this, ah, I should have actually said this explicitly. Of course, these are in this completed while algebra. Otherwise, I wouldn't have introduced it. And so these are differential operators of a certain kind. There's a one half. Oh, right. There's another one half in this notation. Sorry. I should not switch notation. Thanks. Uh, I don't write the one half, but h bar to the one half is in it. So that's why I get confused myself. Sorry. Um, so these are differential operators. And of course, the point of differential operators is that you want to act with them on certain functions and see when that vanishes. And the point of this particular collection is that there is a certain, uh, well, in a certain sense, there is a unique solution. Let me be a bit more explicit. So given an area structure, Let me write it slightly differently. So first of all, what is the equation we want to solve? Um, the way it's usually written is like this. So this has a unique solution.
um, it's a unique solution of a particular kind. So z is going to be the exponent of some other function, and this other function will be written as, well, this is kind of a bit more familiar, we'll have a sum over genus in uh, the half natural numbers. Oh, just a note, natural numbers always include zero for me. And n is an actual natural number, which is not zero. Condition being that 2g minus 2 plus n is positive. You may have seen this condition before, so that may be very familiar to you. Now we've got some h bar. We've got some n factorial. And then we've got fgn, where fgn is in this space. Now, that just means that it's a degree n polynomial, a homogeneous degree n polynomial uh, in E. Okay. Um, now, this looks a bit more like a topological recursion, of course, because at least we've got some kind of genus parameter, we've got some kind of number of variables, because, well, number of variables means that it's going to be of a degree n in a certain sense. We'll still have to do a lot of translations, but this is the first thing. Uh, the way I've written it, it means that, well, this element is not in uh, the completed while algebra, because, for example, it could have negative h-bar, which is not in there. But the conjugation of any of these operators by the z is well defined. So this element will still be in the completed while algebra. And then we want it to act on 1, where 1 is just an element of E. Now, of course, the while algebra has an action on the vector space. That is this action. And we want the result of that to be 0. Yeah. Yes. I should probably, yeah, this is a good question, which, uh, what does this mean? So maybe let's add that. So an, air, an airy structure, which is not necessarily in normal form, is some collection of operators of, uh, with a different index set, such that, um, well, there exists an invertible matrix to make it into normal form. So um, normal form just means that we have this on the nose and otherwise we want it to be this up to some invertible linear transformation. But thanks, that's actually going to be quite important later. Yeah, um, Wait, I haven't given you a construction. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> We have instruction made in this file algebra that we do uh, the uh, space of the Galati X as far as the class of the collectors. But in general, can you reasonably generalize this notation that we do in the algebra to a set of similar rules and rules? 
um, another while algebra in the sense, in what sense? Because this just starts with any vector space. So how would you get another while algebra that is not one of these things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're, they're probably different. Def I mean, there, there's definitely, a, so actually I should say there's a nicely more conceptual definition of this thing uh, recently by uh, Fusha, Kreuzig, and Yoshi, um, which is equivalent, but just written in a more conceptual way, uh, which is not great for calculations, so that's why I'm not giving it. Um, if you want to generalize, I mean, generalizing things is not hard. Generalizing it in to something that makes sense is harder. Uh, I don't know. Um, one thing I can say is that I'm actually going to give a sketch of the proof of this theorem. And of course, the definition of an area structure is made in such a way that the theorem holds. That is the thing we really need. If you see a way to generalize it, go ahead. I mean, probably we could go for other weird fractional powers of h bar. We could add things like that. That doesn't seem to be very useful. But maybe it will be at some point. Um, I, I can't say much about that. For now, this is at least sufficient for our needs. I'm not going to keep this for later in the talks. Right, okay, so the proof is actually not that hard, and that's one of the nice things about this. Um, but I'll still need to check my notes because otherwise I'll make slight mistakes. Mm -mm -mm. I got it. Here we go. Right, so what we want to do, this is some kind of topological recursion. So we will have to do recursion, right? We'll want to build this thing up degree by degree. So the proof is recursion. Recursion. On a degree. So first of all, I'm going to write F is the sum of FD where fd is in, uh, sorry, degree of fd is d. And uh, this condition tells us that uh, this sum starts at d equals zero. Even though we can have negative powers of h bar, the degree does start at zero, so that's good. Can you write the condition? Yes, I can. Um, should I rewrite this? No, please do. Okay, I'll just, yeah, please keep reminding me. I have a tendency to write small. Right, so what do we want to do? Actually, I would like to start with defining, let's call this G as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep adding terms and conjugating these operators H, A, A term by term. Oh, first of all, I'm going to assume that this is a normal form because obviously this theorem does not depend on a linear transformation. So let's just assume that. So this thing will just be this exponent of well, sum up to d. Yeah. Yes, this should be. Thank you. Right. Now, what's nice about this, we're going to do uh, show inductively. We want that H A D acting on one is going to be of order D plus two.
things. It's hard to be correct on the board. Right, this is what we're going to do by induction. And then, of course, if d goes to infinity, that tells us that the entire thing will be zero. And that's what we want. Now, first of all, we always want to start with the base step. We can see that HA0, that's just HA. If this acts on 1, because of the degree 1 condition, this is going to be O of 2, because the linear term is only a differential operator, and of course that annihilates the function 1. So that's good. Now, of course, the induction hypothesis is just that this holds up to uh, d minus 1. And what we want to do is we want to find fg such that we can get one order high. So we already have this being of order d plus 1. And now we want to find fd. such that if we conjugate by that thing only, we can get one order higher. Right? Okay. Now, we can try and calculate this thing. because, well, you may know what these kind of conjugations look like. And again, we're going to use this condition. So what we could get, for example, of course, we will have a term like this again. We will also have a term which comes from the first condition. like this. So this we know is of um, order d plus 1. This will also be of order d plus 1 because, well, this, oh, sorry, degree d plus 1 because this is degree d and this was by definition of the degree of degree 1. And um, it's pretty easy to check that there's nothing else we can get of degree d plus 1. So the rest is O of d plus 2. Now, okay, that's good. So we only want to find fd such that this entire thing is zero. And this is where the second condition starts to come in. Uh, let me see, where do I write that? Some more space here. We will use Poincaré, the Poincaré lemma because now we have this supposed function fd but we only know it's partial derivatives. And if you've paid any attention to uh, lots of differential equations we've seen uh, last few days in, in Paolo's lectures, then you should know these, that kind of com compatibility we want is always talking about mixed derivatives, right? So this system is compatible if this holds, right? Or, of course, strictly speaking, h bar squared. So let's consider the difference. Well, by this formula, we can see that this will be equal to um, mm -mm. Oh, sorry, let me be correct. So we just see that we get these kind of terms, right? 
So let me be correct about this. If I got the sign right, I may have gotten the wrong sign. Anyways, this is plus or D plus two, but we don't care about this because we want a homogeneous solution anyways. And now we just use this condition, right? So how, how did we define these things? We defined them in this way. We can just take the conjugation out of the, um, out of the bracket, which I guess I should do here. So this sum goes up to d minus 1. And now because of this, um, we see that we have this h bar here. So we get something of order at least two. And then this conjugation uh, should be fine because we also know that these things, once we conjugate back, we get something of order d plus one. So this will actually be of the right order to be zero or to be O of d plus two. And that tells us, using the Poincaré lemma, that this FD does actually exist. Moreover, it's actually unique because, well, Poincaré tells us there's some still a constant of integration. But this sum here uh, does not allow for constants because we want n to be at least 1. And that gives us the, well, the constant to be 0, so that gives us a unique solution. And that's the end of the proof, which I guess it ended up somewhere weird, but okay. So at least now, coming back to our grand narrative, we have some way of getting some kind of unique solution of something. The issue is that we have no way how it relate or to relate it to TR yet, so that's going to be um, the rest of the talk. But this is a good start. We have some way of solving something, and it does look a bit like TR because we have these um, things that are, well, there's some kind of H bar, there's some kind of genus related to H bar, and we've got some N as well. So that's good. Now, of course, the point is going to be actually constructing area structures and showing that they are related to what we wanted, namely spectral curves. And, well, there's going to be some kind of black magic somewhere. Black magic being called VOAs, which uh, Raphael skips, I will skip, and I think Kento will also skip. So you may want to learn at some point, but th this is not the time. But we do have to say something about them, or rather about some particular ones. Of course, we don't need the general theory, that's just too much, but there are some specific VOAs that are very useful for constructing area structures. And I'll say a bit about them. Actually, less than we need, but sorry, can't do everything. And I think this section had a very cryptic title, WGLR. I'm not going to actually define WGLR, so this is going to be, well, maybe even hand wavy, I'm not sure. So, okay, first of all, Let's say that, uh, so we, we talked about this, this completed while algebra, 
And while algebras, they have a very nice feature in the sense that they basically have a unique module they work, they act on, a unique or useful one at least. And this is called Foxbase. So let me introduce Foxbase. Um, let me just do it also associated to E. So a fox space associated to E, that is just the vectors, or sorry, the algebra generated by the dual. So these are polynomials in E. So polynomials. In the XA. Um, wait, I wrote on the top. And you can see how this while algebra acts, right? Just by the differential operator action. And now, okay, so I'm not going to say too much about uh, vertex operator algebras, but one thing that is quite important is that this is actually the vector space of a vertex operator algebra, which is called the Heisenberg algebra. So if you do know something about VOAs, this is what we're talking about. If you don't, which is perfectly fine. I will just tell you that there are certain things um, we can construct from VOAs that we will need. So this is called box space. Or I think technically this is bosonic box space. Um, and we want to introduce some things called currents. So if you're more physically minded, you may have also seen these kind of things. So probably among you, quite a few of you will have seen these operators. So I'm just going to write this way. Ah, so actually, maybe I should, this point, take a very a more specific vector space. I'm actually going to introduce a more particular one. I will take a particular basis, which I will index with two letters, where k is uh, a positive integer. So this is from one up to infinity. Okay, sorry. As I said, I have a tendency of going, getting smaller, these things. Right, let me write larger. So we have a large set of variables where k is one, two, etc., and mu is from one up to D. So I'm gonna write it like this again. D is some kind of natural number. Natural number, you know those, I hope. Also, probably not zero because otherwise we won't have any variables to work with. Um, okay, this is just what we start with. So this is my Fox space. Just for future reference, uh, D will be the number of branches. But you can forget about that for now. Now, I'm just going to introduce currents. These depend on X. This X does not have labels, so it's not this X. And yeah, that is a bit confusing. But this X is actually the X of topological recursion, so I couldn't really give it a different name. This is yet another Z, but you've probably seen this one before, so I hope that's okay. Um, let me get the normalization right. And of course, this doesn't tell you anything because I need to define the modes. So these things are called modes. So for positive k, these modes are d 
differentials with respect to our variables. For negative k, they are multiplication operators. And, well, for zero, I'm just going to say zero for now. This is just some form of objects. Um, I mean, it has a meaning, but we're not going to dive into that too much for now. And the only thing I want to say is, well, you can manipulate these things in many different ways. And this is what VOAs encode in a very nice way, actually, but still too complicated. So this is, this somehow is part of uh, the Heisenberg algebra. VOA. So I should drop the name. But what we actually care about is not the Heisenberg VOA, but just a sub VOA. And that is this cryptic thing. Where I guess, I, well, should have probably just taken R here, sorry. And so what this means, uh, so this sub VOA, this is the one we're interested in, and this is generated in a sense by uh, combinations of these currents. Again, I'm going to be more specific about it in a mo moment. But these combinations are going to be the elementary symmetric polynomials. So this is generated in a certain way, which uh, some people will add adjectives to that, I guess. These we call WI. These are elementary symmetric polynomials in Well, basically in the currents. I'm going to be more specific about this in a moment. Now, more specifically, which will be now, um, I'm going to give you some formulas for this. They're going to be pretty bad, but that's just the way it is. So one important part of VOA is that there is some kind of correspondence between uh, the vector space, so that's this thing, and operators on that vector space. These j's are one example of that. And we want to, and, and of course, if we look at operators of, on a vector space, these have some kind of algebra structure. That's what we're actually interested in because we want to uh, find some kind of algebra. Because recall, we want to find area structures. We want to have this sub-algebra condition there where if we have two operators, then their product or their uh, commutator is again one of these operators in a certain sense. So that's what we're going for. We're not going to do this entire state field correspondence as it's called. We're just going to find some sub operate, uh, some sub algebra. And that's going to be given by these things. And yeah, so this is going to be again a horrible formula. But okay, so first of all, this is again going to be dependent on some function x because you see we've got some function x here. So I'm just going to say that this will also be decomposed into modes. And these modes are the ones we're actually interested in. Um, the reason that the formulas will be bad is because we want to write things in normal order. Normal order just means that we want to have multiplication operators to the left, differentiation operators to the right, which you can see um, if you take some elementary symmetric polynomials in these kind of currents, 
will get messy. But um, it gets messy for the right reasons, because the mess is exactly what we need for topological recursions. So, okay. Mm, not right. Um, I feel like there there are several people in this room who have a lot of better geometric idea about this for now. Um, but okay, so actually, maybe in, in uh, Raphael's formalism from yesterday and, and the day before yesterday. Uh, which I will probably not be able to uh, do justice to. But anyways, um, you should think of R here as the degree of our cover, or rather the, uh, so GLR is basically the group, uh, I don't know what, what to call this group, but the, we're looking at a bundle of rank R and we have GLR acting on it. So these are the, this is basically the space of matrices. Um, and one form, like, Forms with matrices is something we've seen a lot uh, last few days. Pretty sure that's related to this, but details. For me, it's just an input for the construction, and I'll give you a connection to all of the geometry later on. That's not a very satisfactory answer, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, right. Actually, so this is all, for me, this is just an abstract algebra machinery to get something geometric later. But I'll give you some hints here and there about the actual geometry. Right. So, formula time. And yeah, it's going to be a bit of a mess for a moment, but I'll guide you through it. So we have this index i, so that's the i elementary symmetric polynomial, which you should just think of as if we have a uh, if we have a polynomial, then these elementary symmetric polynomials they express the coefficients of the polynomial in terms of the roots. That's a useful way of thinking about it. In terms of matrices, um, they determine powers of traces, or sorry, traces of powers in terms of eigenvalues. Combinatorial factors, sorry, have to be done. So, okay, what's happening? We want to express this in normal ordered form, as I said before. Every time we have a differential op uh, operator to the left of a multiplication operator, we have to co uh, commute the two. We get some term like uh, what I'm going to write soon. And that is why we get a mess. But as I said before, this mess is quite nice because it actually encodes the singular part of omega zero two. Um, sorry, this is actually sum. And you'll see that in a bit once I've finished writing. Some weird psi. Yeah, so this is a bit of a technical part, but that's just the way it is. So this sum is up to the floor of i over 2. Because every time we have a commutator, we're pairing off two things. The commutator will be, a, uh, well, it, it will basically make two of the currents drop out. So this J is the number of times we actually take a commutator. And then, so we have a sum over remaining things. So these are the things that do not end up in the commutator. So that's just going to be the currents. Uh, I should not. Uh, this, so a j, so the remaining indices. So we have these these j pairs. Sure. So the first two j don't participate. Then we have a two j plus one up to a i. 
these go, sorry, this pen is not going to do, to survive for much longer. Um, that one is better. So AI, these go from zero. This is a very bad zero, sorry, up to R minus one. Mm -mm -mm. So here we've normal ordered everything and then all the complications in the Psi, which we can write down. That's the horrible part, but okay. The shape is kind of nice because it looks like omega zero twos. See, there's a difference. We're dividing by the square of the difference. It's nice. These thetas are arth roots of unity. Or theta is an arth root of unity, I should say. So at this point, I can answer something about the geometry. What we're doing here is basically we take x equals z to the r. And, well, in that case, the sheets, the different sheets, are indexed by a root of unity. They will be z times a certain root of unity. This root of unity is what we call theta. So this is exponent of 2 pi i over r. And you see that here we're summing over the exponents of theta. The exponents of theta must be distinct because we must take different things in the fiber. And uh, we see contributions of omega zero two. And the other parts are basically just paired with these currents. This is what's going on geometrically. But we actually got this from some arcane VOA stuff that, again, I'm not going to get into much. But here you can see that this is the right track because we can interpret this in terms of spectral curves and topological recursion. So this is the outlook. And well, yeah, it's a bad formula, but if you have this point of view, it's, uh, it makes sense. Yeah. Please, yes. Go ahead, anyways. <laughs> it's like it's a bit, it's a bit misleading with uh, the representation that you get there. It's the one that's coming from Hindi or something you call them a theme series. So yeah, it's coming from a different representation. Oh yes, I'm going to go into that just after this. I mean, that's uh, that's if it's a good point. Yeah. Like you wrote the right, so you won't, won't be able to get up to that. Um, that's true, and I'm actually going to give something more general as well, but. Um, yeah, I'm going to say something about it, but... Even more complicated than what it looks. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm misleading you here. Um, yeah, so actually, Nissan is completely right. And these are rather um, twisted. Well, so basically a, a VOA, so it, it has this vector space and it has some kind of operators on it, which corresponds to the vector space. So it is basically an algebra together with a module over it. And you can take different modules, and this is actually a representation in a different module. Is well, still a very sloppy way of saying it, but not quite as incorrect as before. Um, and these, mo these twisted modules are what we're interested in. So, yeah, I hope that's okay. I'm not gonna say too much more. Yes, please. Yeah, right. 
Um, yeah, right. So if you set h bar equals zero, then of course everything commutes and everything is nice. Um, but also, if you set h bar equals zero in topological recursion, not much suffice. So let's not do that. Uh, okay. Right. So I gave you this intuit intuitive picture that this is related to x equals z to the r. But I also told you that I want to do something more general. So we're going to make this even more complicated. And what I would like to do now is I, I gave you an example before where um, basically the formula for the spectral curve was reducible. And I want to do that again. So what I want to do, I'm starting to add some geometry in the picture. So we can have some x equals z to the r mu. And let's take a product from mu equals 1 up to some number d. And I want this to be 0. So this is now clearly some kind of reducible spectral curve because every component is in itself already a curve. And the 0 locus of the product is the union of these components. And you also see that all of these are ramified over 0. So the point x equals 0 is getting pretty complicated. But we can see if that still works. Now, um, I just said very shortly that this is actually, this corresponds to a twisted module. And that was a transitive twist. We're going to do some slightly different twists. So we're going to make it more complicated because we want to make our spectral curve more complicated. Because the goal of these lectures was actually to uh, make things as complicated as possible, basically, or as general as possible. So let's do that. So first of all, if you look at this, of course, each of these individual components is just fine. And that's basically what I described here, one of these components. So now I'm just going to add a label mu everywhere and say, hey, this is one of these components. So this is a mu. This is getting a mu. Um, this is now getting a mu. Uh, add an r somewhere else. Yeah, here. And I guess I should also add a mu here. Um, okay, nothing changed. I add some, added some mu's. Now, one nice thing about elementary symmetric polynomials, I just told you that they give you the coefficients of a polynomial if you know the roots. Now, if you have a partial decomposition of a polynomial, then that's already kind of halfway between having roots and having the coefficients, right? If you have a polynomial, which is, well, you can either write it as a sum over, say, c k x to the k, some polynomial of x, or you can write it as a product of x minus r j, but you can also put something in between, right? For example, you can do some products of, so let's say this is a degree r, so k equals 0 to r. It's a product, j equals 1 to r, some extra c. Um, we can put something in between where now we have a product from mu equals 1 to g, and the sum from j equals 1 to r mu, where these are now c mu k x to the k. Right? These are all somehow equivalent descriptions. If you work out this picture, well, first of all, we know that ck is the r minus k elementary symmetric polynomial up to a sign of the rj. Oh, I'm now using r for different things, sorry. I'll call these s. So this is one way of describing them. But uh, we can also first calculate these as elementary symmetric polynomials, and then calculate these out of those numbers. So it's basically a two-step process. 
And that's what we're doing here, because we first now define these to be the elementary symmetric polynomials on one of these components. But then later on, we want to have the complete, well, the, the elementary symmetric polynomials for the entire thing. And let me go over there. Um, so this R is just a degree of the polynomial. And here we have some R mu such that they sum up. To, yeah, so the sum of the R mu must be R. Thanks. And that's the same here. So the R mu are the degrees of each of these individual components. And we just define the total, deg well, the total degree of this thing will be the sum of these degrees. So think of, well, again, this picture is, is going to be um, hard because I cannot draw in four dimensions, sorry. But think of these being like individual components. Then this would be, would have R1 equals 2. Let me draw it slightly differently. R2, R2 equals 3. And R then equals 5. This is kind of what you should be thinking about. Even though um, these points are actually the same. But I can't draw that, sorry. Do I have a Z? Here. No. Not yet. Uh, I'm not going to add subscripts on Zs because we already have that, but uh, I'm going to come back to that. Right, um, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to have some interplay between elementary symmetric polynomials on each of these components and elementary symmetric polynomials on the entire thing. Um, so... Because what we had here, I started with this, uh, well, this is VOA, and this is only given on R. So what we want, we want to really do use this sub VOA for the inter for the complete degree for R. But then we uh, actually decompose these Ws that we've defined in terms of all the different components. That is our goal, and well, I can give you a formula. And it's not actually that bad because it's basically going to be this formula. Um, let's see. So I should say that um, I don't know much about these VOAs, but really it's very important that they're generated by exactly the elementary symmetric polynomials. That's why all of this works. So this is the important part. The rest you can mostly forget about. I didn't talk about it anyway, so you can't forget, but sure. Right, so I have to find them in this way, but of course in elementary symmetric polynomials, if you look at them this way, it's maybe better to just define something which is called wx with an extra variable, which I should have used there already. And this will just be the wix times u to the r minus i. So from i equals 0 to r, where I guess, I mean, if i equals 0, then this becomes 1. So. And then I want to just say that this is going to be the product from mu equals 1 to d, sum from i equals 0 to r mu. So this is a definition. And now you can figure out the definite or the actual formula for these things. It's not going to be pretty on coefficients, but this is the relation you should remember. Um, I should add some notation here, I guess, just to distinguish between different things we have. 
OK, so this was quite technical. Now, the point of all of this is that because we started from a VOA, what we actually have is um, we have some algebra condition or some algebra, algebra structure. And remember that if we look at an area structure, we want, this is what we want to construct. We want to construct an area structure which is related to topological recursion. And we're somehow on our way because we have something which is algebraic and looks a bit like topological recursion. And it's supposed to have some kind of algebra structure. Now, we're not really there yet in either direction, but well, it's, it's a good start. Now, of course, there's also a big issue because there were two conditions for an area structure. One of them is this, this algebra condition. The other one is the degree one condition. Now, I want to, at some points, so these, again, these, these can be decomposed in modes. So we, we have these WIKs. And I basically would like these to be our area structure. But that's not going to happen because WI, by construction, is homogeneous of degree I. So they're not going to have a degree one component. So that's one of the issues we have. And um, we need to solve that. But I think my time is about up. So for now, I'll just keep that as an issue. And I'll hint that we will do that by something called a dilaton shift. And that is a way of introducing omega zero one. So for now, this is basically probably not the best point to stop because you've just seen a lot of stuff without understanding it. But uh, you'll learn more in the afternoon. Thanks. Yeah, the, the formula, the Bouchard in our recursion formula is basically the same. Um, yes, in certain cases there will actually be an exercise about that. Uh, I, will, I will be able to say more once we've gone through more of the construction, um, but yes. Ooh, um, okay, that point, okay, we definitely don't know enough like that. Um, I, I, I should also say that, uh, so this construction is basically known, but uh, if you want to, there, there are more, uh, at some, certain points in, in the next part of the lecture, I will indicate points where things can be generalized, uh, where like this also, work in progress we're currently doing with uh, Nitin and uh, Vincent Bouchard, Gaetan Moreau and uh, Sergei Chadrin about deformations where we need to do a slightly different approach and slightly different uh, assumptions um, which may shed light on this I'm not sure but so let's say that there's a partial answer with not a complete one yet and can I talk? Just because you don't want to, right? Um, <laughs> the answer is yes, and I won't. Um, well, yeah, right. sure. I should probably say that, right? Or shouldn't it be SL2 though? Uh, yeah, that's. Yeah, but if you don't know Heisenberg, then that doesn't help, right? So SL2 is Virasor. That's probably a good one to mention. Yeah. Right. So I refer you to uh, next lecture by Kento.